There are many, many, many tabletop role-playing games out there, but the best known one by a country mile is Dungeons and Dragons. But how do you play it? What can you expect from your first session? And what are some of the rules you need to look out for? Worry not, brave adventurers. My name is Johnny, and I'm here to tell you exactly that. Let's start with the very, very basics. Dungeons and Dragons is a pen and paper role-playing game. In order to play, you'll need a set of polyhedral dice, some character sheets, pencils, and the rules to the game. The player's handbook is the best resource for information on how the game works and how to make characters. You can play D&D basically forever with just this book. The monster manual is also very good, containing lots of weird and wonderful creatures for the players to encounter. Of course, there are loads of other books available with different settings, fully plotted campaigns, and details on playing additional races, but if you're looking for the very basics, then the Player's Handbook is absolutely the place to start. In a game of Dungeons & Dragons, one player, commonly known as the Dungeon Master, acts as both referee and story guide, helping to propel the adventure along and provide challenges for the players to overcome along the way. Each player will have their own character with a backstory, a set of different abilities, and an overall outlook on life. When the players want to act, they say what it is they're trying to do. If it's something very simple, like crossing a room to start a conversation, the DM will likely just let that happen, so the game will continue uninterrupted. If a player tries to do something that requires skill or special effort, however, the DM will ask them for a roll. The player will roll a 20-sided die, commonly referred to as a d20, and the outcome will determine whether the attempt was successful or not. For example, if a player tries to kick down a door and rolls well enough, they'll succeed. If not, the door will remain intact. Either way, the outcome is narrated by the DM, and play continues. Different characters are good at different things, depending on the choices the players made during character creation. We'll get on to exactly how that works later, but for now, let's look at a character sheet. Every character sheet has some core stats. These are Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. As the names suggest, strength governs the hitting and lifting of things, dexterity covers being agile and the fine manipulation of objects. Constitution affects your health and your ability to resist things like poison or fatigue. Intelligence is for analysing information. Wisdom is about common sense and perception. And charisma is the ability to influence others, whether that's through persuasion, intimidation, or any other social means. Every character has a score in each of these categories. These are referred to as ability scores. These are numerical indicators of how capable the character is in each of these key areas. How strong or intelligent they are, how dexterous or wise. Now, all of these numbers at first glance might be off-putting, but don't worry, you don't have to remember any of them, and they only become important during certain points when your character levels up. The reason for this is that these scores are boiled down to simple modifiers, and those are the important bits. If you have a high score in strength, for example, you might have a plus three modifier. What this means is, whenever the DM asks you to make a roll for something involving strength, again, let's say you're trying to kick a door down, you roll a d20 and add three to the result in order to reflect your character's raw strength. In addition to your six core abilities, D&D also features a number of skills, ranging from things like acrobatics or athletics, to mental skills like investigation or perception, to social skills like persuasion or intimidation. Each of these skills is tied to an attribute. Acrobatics, for example, is linked to dexterity, while athletics is linked to strength. Each character has a few skills they are particularly good at. Again, these are determined in character creation. These skills are highlighted on the character sheet by a little black dot next to the skill name. If you have a dot in a skill, you are said to be proficient in that skill. What this means is, whenever you roll for a skill in which you have proficiency, you not only add on the ability modifier, but you also add on your proficiency bonus. The proficiency bonus is a catch-all number that reflects your skill or special knowledge in any given area. So to come back to our example of kicking the door down, the DM would, in all probability, ask for a strength 
athletics check. This is basically D&D &D jargon to let the player know they're about to attempt something involving the strength skill, and it's time to pick up a die. So our player grabs the d20 and looks at their sheet. They see their character has a plus three modifier in strength and that they also have proficiency in athletics. Their proficiency bonus is two, so they're going to roll a d20 and add three from their strength and two from their proficiency to make a total of plus five. They roll a 13, so their final score for the attempt is an 18. So that's how you make a roll and incorporate the modifiers particular to your character in order to reflect their inherent skill set. But what does a result of 18 actually mean? How do you determine success or failure in Dungeons & Dragons? For the most part, that's up to the DM. As well as deciding what the most appropriate skill is when a character makes a test, they set a target number for the roll in order to reflect how difficult the action is. This target number is referred to as the difficulty class or DC. Let's say in our eternal door kicking example that the door is in good repair but it's made of fairly thin wood and is not reinforced. The DC for that roll might be a 10, making it a relatively straightforward task. In this instance, that result of 18 would easily be a success and the door would be kicked right in. If the door in question was an iron banded oak door a foot thick, however, kicking it in might be a DC of 20 and therefore the 18 would be a fail. So most of the time in D&D, you'll be rolling a 20 sided die and paying attention to two numbers, the result of your roll, including modifiers and the difficulty class. However, there are two numbers on the D20 itself that you also ought to bear in mind. These are the one and the 20, because these numbers are crits. Rolling a 20 is a critical success. It means not only do you achieve what it is you set out to do, but you do it extremely well. If you're trying to persuade someone to sit down and talk to you, for example, a crit might instantly make them your friend. If you're swinging a sword at somebody, you would hit them especially hard, and we'll cover exactly how that works when we get to combat. On the other hand, a one is a critical fail. If you're trying to convince someone to sit down and talk to you, you say the worst possible thing in that moment. If you're swinging a sword, your sword might break or fly out of your hands, or you might even hit somebody you didn't mean to harm. Crits exist to inject a little extra drama into proceedings, giving you that extra bit of success when you really need it, or, as is so often the case, threatening to undo all of your plans in one fell swoop. So hopefully now you understand not only how roles work on a basic mechanical level, but also how the DM will guide you through the experience of playing and rolling. You say what you want to do, they tell you what to roll and how high you need to roll in order to succeed. This allows you to focus on the storytelling elements of what you want your character to do and, to an extent, let the DM worry about interpreting that in actual game terms. If you're watching this as a brand new player and you find the whole idea intimidating in other words, don't worry, you're in good hands. As long as you have a decent idea of what your character is good or bad at, you can just focus on playing that character and you'll pick up the mechanical stuff as you go. In other words, you don't need to memorize the entire rulebook in order to start playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's okay to stop and ask a question about how things work, and it's all right to get your character to attempt something without knowing exactly how it's done. But since this is a how-to video, I might as well explain a couple more things you ought to be at least aware of when trying D&D for the first time. The first of these is saving throws. While for the most part your character interacts with the world by taking the initiative and making skill tests, sometimes the unexpected might happen. They might be attacked, someone might try to cast a spell on them, they might step onto a trap, or perhaps the rope bridge they're walking across might break. In these moments, harm is coming the character's way and they only have a split second to try and avoid it. In this instance, the DM will ask you to make a saving throw, specifying one of the core stats your character has. 
A dexterity saving throw, for example, or maybe a constitution one. If it were a dexterity saving throw, you would roll a d20 and then add your dexterity modifier, just like you would for a normal dexterity test. What makes a saving throw different, however, is that you don't consult the skill list to see if your proficiency bonus gets involved. Instead, there's a separate box specifically for saving throws, which will indicate which ones you are and aren't able to use your proficiency bonus for. So you make the roll, add the appropriate ability modifier and your proficiency bonus if it's applicable, and then you see if you rolled high enough to avoid or lessen the damage. Fairly straightforward, but still different enough to normal skill checks to be worth talking about. So that's a basic summary of how the game is likely to play out while you're going around doing your standard bits of adventuring. Whether that's investigating an area for clues, trying to talk to somebody to gain information, or venturing into one of those dungeons everyone seems so keen on. But of course, sooner or later the party is going to come up against some adversaries, and it's here the game takes on a very different structure. Let's talk about combat. When the players enter combat, time slows down. This is because, in a fight, everybody is doing things all at the same time, because, more often than not, they're fighting for their lives. To stop things from getting confusing, and in order to give each combatant a chance to defend themselves, combat is split into a series of rounds. Before combat begins, the order in which everybody will take their turns is determined. This is called rolling for initiative. When you roll for initiative, you roll a d20 and add your dexterity modifier on top. Whatever number you get is your initiative number. The higher the number, the earlier you'll go in each combat round. Note that initiative is only rolled once for a combat. The turn order stays the same for each round, no matter how long the combat lasts. So, once it's your turn in combat, what exactly can you do? On a combat turn, each character can move up to their speed, which is written in feet on their character sheet, and they can perform an action. For instance, you might attack, you might use an action to cast a spell, but you can also use it for other things like special abilities, attempts to talk the enemy out of fighting, swinging across a chasm on a rope, healing, you name it, basically. In essence, the players narrate what it is they're trying to do, just the same as they do in the rest of the game, and the DM translates that into a role for the player to attempt. The main difference here is that characters can only do so many things at a time in order to keep the fight balanced and give all combatants a chance. During a combat turn, players are also able to perform minor actions at the discretion of the DM. They might want to kick an object across the floor to somebody else, for example, or yell something to their fellow adventurers. Because these are relatively small actions, the DM is likely to allow one or two of these in the course of any given combat turn. But, as I said, most players use their turn to attack when in combat, so how does that work? Well, it's largely the same as performing a normal test. If a player is swinging a great axe, they'll make an attack using their strength characteristic. If they are noted as being proficient in the use of axes, they'll be allowed to add their proficiency bonus, just like they do when they have proficiency in a skill. Other weapons, like bows or rapiers, would use the dexterity stat instead. The target number for an attack roll is determined by how hard the target is to damage. Instead of the DC or difficulty class, this is the AC or armor class. Every character has one, including you. The armor class is a reflection of a being's natural toughness plus any armor they may have equipped. If the number is met or exceeded, the attack has hit and damage can then be applied. If the roll is under the AC number, however, it's a miss and no damage is taken. Each weapon has its own damage. For a rapier, it's an 8-sided die or a d8. If you hit somebody with a rapier, you roll a d8 and then add on your dexterity modifier to the result. And that's how many points of damage you do. Now, you'll remember we were talking about critical hits earlier. Well, if you roll a 20 on your attack, you get to double the damage done by the dice which is pretty nifty. Damage, when taken, is subtracted from a character or creature's current hit point level, a numerical representation of their health, in the same way you might expect from a video game. When it comes to monsters, hitting zero points commonly means that the creature dies. 
With player characters and some NPCs, however, hitting zero isn't necessarily the end. If your character reaches zero hit points, they are incapacitated. They lose consciousness and are, effectively, bleeding out. At this point, they have to start making death saves. Death saves are saving throws that determine whether a character has the strength to hang in there or whether their time is truly up. If a character passes a death save, they will remain unconscious but will be stabilised. If they fail all their death saves, however, then that's the end of the line for them. Right, so that's a basic overview of how you play Dungeons & Dragons from rolling a die to having a fight. Now, the third pillar of D&D undoubtedly is magic, but the problem is that is such a vast topic that I can't really do it justice from within this one video. So, with all apologies, we're going to have to skip that one and come back to it another day. For now, let's look at how you make a character. Making a character in D&D revolves around three main choices. Race, class, and alignment. Race determines whether you're playing as a human, elf, dwarf, half-orc, tiefling, tabaxi, you name it, there are absolutely loads of playable races in D&D. At the time of recording, the race you choose will impact on your core stats and also convey certain traits, referred to as racial traits. Wizards of the Coast is currently looking at how these systems work, however, so we may see some changes in the future. The reason for this is that they play into bioessentialism, which is a racist and outdated concept. For example, a wood elf gets plus two on dexterity, meaning they'll be better at archery. And that's as true for a wood elf character who has grown up among elves as it would be for one who was orphaned and grew up with, let's say, orcs. And that's where the issue lies. It's one thing to say that elves are often trained as archers and therefore anybody who grew up with elves gets a plus two dex modifier because archery is important to elves. That's one thing. But saying someone is naturally good at archery just because they are born an elf is pretty much the same thing as saying black people are fast or Asian people are naturally gifted at maths. So that's what's potentially changing and why, but anyway, for now, you pick a race for your character and then you get some natural modifiers to add on. After that, you pick a class. This determines how your character interacts with the world and what's important to them. Can they wield magic, for example? Are they attuned to nature? Are they good at fighting? Are they religious? Do they follow a code or a strong set of moral ideals? Picking a class is kind of like choosing an occupation, but also an approach to problem solving. It determines what skills you're proficient in, gives you different abilities and gear proficiencies, and also determines how many hit points you have, all as a result of your training. After that, you need to determine your ability scores. You can do this by rolling dice for each skill and taking the result, whether good or bad. You can use a preset range of numbers called a standard array and assign them to your skills as you desire. Or you can use point buying to manually generate the ability scores and set your skill levels exactly where you want them. You then choose a background for your adventurer, which gives them some other abilities as well as a general outlook on life, and then all you need to do is pick your starting equipment, give them a name, and you're ready to go. Magic wielding characters do need to pick spells, of course, but again, that's something we're going to have to cover in a different video. This, of course, is a purely mechanical overview of how to make a character. If you want to know more about making a good character in terms of their backstory, motivations and flaws, I've already made a video about that very topic, which should be on the screen now. And that is basically how you play D&D. During your first session, you can expect a lot of stopping and starting as you look things up or ask questions on how certain things work, or even ask what your character can do in that particular situation. And that's absolutely fine. Like I say, this is a game you learn by playing as much as by book reading. So even though there will probably be some nerves around the table, you shouldn't worry. Hopefully you'll also have a lot of fun. And that's about it from me. Hopefully this video has proved interesting and has got you excited about playing Dungeons and Dragons. 
If you want more from Dicebreaker on pen and paper role playing games, we've got loads of stuff on offer from how to videos to full on campaign playthroughs. Some of those videos should be on screen now, but make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss anything else from Dicebreaker. Most importantly, though, thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day. Thank you.